I will be, be chairing this, this morning's session. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, the plenary speaker for this session, who is Jean-Pierre Tillich from INRIA. And he's going to be telling us about LDPC codes. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. OK, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers to give me the opportunity to speak about quantum LDPC codes. And okay, first question would be, why on earth should we be interested in such kind of codes? And more precisely, in decoding them. Well, there is a rather recent research of Dan Gottesman, which says the following. Assume you have a good enough family of quantum LDPC codes. Good enough meaning that they have good minimum distance properties. I will talk about later on what I mean exactly by this. And assume that they are efficiently decodable. Then, with such a family, basically you could perform full tolerant quantum computation with constant overhead. And the constant overhead is just the rate of the quantum LDPC code you are using. Rate meaning here the number of encoded qubits divided by the number of qubits that the code needs. So it's a very, very satisfying uh, result. But the problem is, do we have such codes? Well, there will be no answer after this talk, OK? But still, I'm going to explain what's going on here on this topic. And I will probably also explain why there are other reasons why this kind of code is interesting. But this is something what we are going to see uh, during the talk. You might be really, you know, so, so someone coming from a classical coding f f community might be very surprised by the fact that people in quantum have problems to do this. Just because they have exactly this in the classical setting. They have classical LDPC codes which have very, very good minimum distance properties much better than basically what we need in Gottesman's theorem. And they have a low complexity decoding algorithm, which is almost linear in the length of the code. And more than this, uh, there is a, res a rather recent result uh, in 2012, which says that if you use this decoder with a well-chosen LDPC code, then you can attain the capacity of most memoryless channel of interest. This with this decoding algorithm. And same code, and it attains, basically it's, it's able actually to decode any channel with this kind of capacity. So very, very, very satisfying answer to the problem of coding in the classical setting, and there's no surprise now that this kind of codes appear in most telecommunication standards right now in the classical setting. Well, now let me try to explain in a few minutes what a quantum LDPC code is and how it differs from classical LDPC codes. So this, to define this class of codes, I will need the polygroup, as everybody knows. So you have this x, y, and z, x, which is the qubit flip, z, which is the phase flip, y, a combination of them. And you take just tons of product of this guy, plus some phase, which is plus or minus i, plus or minus 1. We all know that these guys are either commute or anti-commute. The x, z, and y, they all anti-commute with each other. And the tensor product, you just uh, count the number of anti-commutation to see if they commute or not. I will use this notation, shorthand notation here, 
for commutation, which is the start, which just means it's zero if the polygroup element they commute, it's one if they anti-commute. And quantum LDBC codes are just defined from this polygroup in the following way. They are stabilizer codes, so in Gottesman, Caderban, Reigns, Shaw, Sloan, Sands, so you take an abelian subgroup of this polygroup, Let's say you choose n minus k elements which are independent and which do not this stabilize a subgroup should not contain minus identity. In this case, the code which is defined from this is of dimension two to the k and can encode k qubits just by the set of states which are stabilized here by the stabilizer group elements. And what does it mean now, a quantum LDPC code? Well, it's just a code for which there exists a set of generators here which have low weight. So this is already something what you might need in practice. Low weight means here that you just perform you know, measurements involving a very small number of qubits, and but it's good actually in full tolerance setting for obvious reasons. And uh, the result uh, of a measurement is just the fact whether or not the error E here, which occurred, which I'm assuming here, but it's also a poly error, commutes or not with the stabilizer I chose for the code. So this is the information that you have, and now you want to decode. Basically, you want to find the right error. It's not completely this. I'm coming to this issue right now here. So this actually is something which differs in a very fundamental way. This is a fundamental difference between the classical setting and the quantum setting. Assume that you have a guy which is in the stabilizer code, there is some poly error which occurred, and well, it turns out that this error has the same syndrome as the, the error which occurred multiplied by some guy which is in the stabilizer group, just because the stabilizer group actually gives, has zero syndrome with respect uh, to to the stabilizer because it's an abelian subgroup. So just because of this reason, maybe you, you, do, you, you, you make an error in decoding and you, uh, you decide that the error was not E, but was E times S. So you perform the inverse of this error, but even if you do, do this, you get the right state back just because as Daga applied to Psi is still, is still Psi just because of the definition of the stabilizer code, which is invariant by any guy actually on the stabilizer group. So you have some freedom of choice in the quantum setting that you do not have in the classical setting. And it's one of the reasons why actually computing the capacity of very simple channels in the quantum setting is basically a nightmare. You know, you have a freedom of choice that you do not have in classical setting. Basically, channel capacity in the classical case just is amounts to the fact that the amount of information that you have on the error, the number of bits that you have here, is basically the logarithm of the number of typical errors. This gives you actually the capacity of a channel. You don't have something so simple in the quantum setting. Okay, but this is something that you have to keep in mind. And uh, so because of this, the minimum weight is not the weight of a guy that has zero syndrome, but you do not see that, which has the same behavior as the identity, which would, could be actually potentially a guy in the stabilizer, you throw out the guys <coughs> in the stabilizer group. You don't, in, you're not interested in them be just because actually they have no effect on the code. So really the bad guys are the guys which have zero syndrome, which commutes if every guy in the stabilizer, minus actually the guys in the stabilizers. 
And uh, last thing that I should say, introduction um, about uh, quantum LDPC code is the following fact is uh, there is a graph which is associated to um, such a construction which is very useful for decoding and which is the following one. You just, there are two types of nodes here. The two types of nodes are first of all nodes which, are pl which have pluses here, which are associated to the generator that I chose, and nodes here which are in black, which are associated to the qubit. So I have a four qubit code here, length four. So I have four black nodes and three plus nodes here, and I put a link between a plus node and a qubit node if and only if a generator is involved in a non-trivial fashion in this qubit. For instance, here, this generator here, which has two x, which is represented here by these two blue edges here, which correspond to the two x which are here, and these are the two first qubits which are here. Okay, so you can represent this, and this graph is very useful to understand how the decoding behaves. And now that you uh, know everything about quantum bell DPC codes, you might say, well, you guys are kidding. I know how to decode these guys, okay? Be this is easy. Because I have stabilizer which have low weight. So low weight, let's say, I. I have a stabilizer which is of size four. Suppose this stabilizer has only four axes. Okay, good. Now I assume you know a very simple error model when I have no error on a qubit with 90% of time and the rest of the time I have a x, y, or z with the same probability, 10% divided by three. So assume that you have something like this. And now assume that one of these stabilizer, when you measure it, it says the error anti-commutes, okay? When it anti-commutes, it means that at least I should have one of these uh, qubits which should have an error. And with this error model, actually, typically, you just have one error and not more than this. And so this gives you a lot of information about your error. It just means that actually that typically what happens is that one of these four qubits is either a Y or a Z. Okay, lot of information. And now you say, with this lot of information, I'm able to decode. What I'm going to do? I'm just getting all this information about all these generators and I'm performing, let's say, some majority word and I'm done. <laughs> well, basically, you are done in the classical setting if you do this but not in the quantum <coughs> setting. This does not work. And well, no, let me try to explain why this doesn't work in the uh, quantum uh, setting, just by explaining actually how people do it in the classical setting, and they do it even much better in the classical setting, because what people do in the classical setting they do much more, much better than this uh, majority vote. They are even able actually to compute for each position the probability that the error was something given the whole single. At least they are able to estimate this for LDPC code. And if I give you this, then it's easy actually to find the right error. You just perform according to the probability the right choice. That's all. So this is what they do in the classical setting. And why does this work in the classical setting? Because in the classical setting, we have a picture which is tree-like like this. So you have a bit here. The bit, bits are in black too here. And what you are going to do here, you have, you know, an error model. And from this error model and from the measure of this syndrome, you are going to say something that the probability that the error on this bit was something, okay? You know this. You're able to calculate this. This is just a local calculation. You do the same calculation here for the same thing. And so, classical setting, you have two independent information coming from here 
you can put them together and compute actually the probability that the error was something given actually both syndrome which is here. This is just a local calculation which is easy to do and basically can be done whenever you have a tree here. So good. And now what it turns out that you can perform this recursively. So you can perform this calculation at this level of the tree here for each of these nodes, pass this information as a new information from the probability for this bit. And finally, what you can get here at the second iteration is the probability that the error was something given all these syndromes here. And so basically with this local computation, what's going on, you are actually performing at the end after a certain number of iteration, a global computation, which is the probability that the error was something given a whole bunch of syndromes. Okay, at some point actually, you, you are not getting um, a tree and you have to stop the calculation. But basically you are able actually to compute something given a polynomial number of guys. And that's enough actually to do the calculation. And so it's exactly why this works in the classical setting. And now, what is the problem in the quantum setting? Why does this simple algorithm doesn't work at all? Well, basically, there are two problems. First problem is that in order to perform this calculation exactly, you need a tree, just because you need independent information, basically. Well, in the quantum setting, forget about having a tree. Why should you forget this? Well, let's come back actually to the stabilizer formalism. The stabilizer, they have to, uh, to form an abelian subgroup. They have to commute. So let's uh, look at, for instance, actually, the first stabilizer, S1 here, and the second stabilizer. Uh, they have one position in common. But X and Z, they anti-commute. So it means actually that there should be a second position actually for which you should have a non-trivial action for which enables this stabilizer to commute. And this gives you actually this foresight I'm talking about. So forget about having a tree. Now you might say, well, why not, why not do going to do the same kind of calculation and just cheating? Per just pretend that I have a tree, perform the same computation as if I had a tree, and look if it, this is working. You could do this, but still, this doesn't work. Because there is a second problem, and this is the worst kind of problem. Is that by the very definition of a stabilizer <coughs> uh, code, you have this stabilizer which have low weight. And so you say, okay, this is good for me. I, I just have to perform local measurements. That, that's, that's good for me. I like them. Well, the decoder does not like them at all. Just look at an example here. And the decoder does not like them at all if I have an error which is exactly half of a stabilizer. Look at this example. Here this is, okay, the toric code in the non-usual fashion. This is in the Turner graph definition. So here you have the qubits are in black here. Every qubit is involved in four generators. There are two generators uh, which involve only these here. And what's going on here, assume here that I have this, uh, I have a generator which are these four Vs which are here. And assume that I have an error on these two qubits which are exactly a Z and a Z. So exactly half of a generator. Well, because of uh, the stabilizer, that stabilizer has zero syndromes, it turns out that an error which is Z and Z here has exactly the same syndrome as an error which will be Z and Z here and nothing uh, uh, everywhere. So the second part of the stabilizer will give you this exactly the same syndrome. 
and now just assume that I'm, you know, I was very, really good actually in decoding everything, but with the except of these four guys which are in the stabilizer. So I know the error and everything, I was able to throw out the error. And now I just want to calculate what people are able to calculate easily in the classical setting. Just the probability that the error is something on these two qubits. And just if you do the calculation, just because of the fact that you have two errors which have basically the same probabilities but they each differ here, you can compute that, uh, you can check that the probability that the error was either I or Z at this four position is exactly one half. And so you are stuck here. You can do nothing. You basically hesitate on all these four qubits between an, an I and a Z. And this is definitely unavoidable. And you have, you know, a linear number of guys which occur with a reasonable error model when you have a quantum LDPC code. And so basically you have to get rid of this. And so you say, hey, wait a second. Here you showed me the toric code and I know how to decode it, okay? I have zillions of algorithms to decode it. The first one was KTF uh, minimum weight perfect matching decoder, but it's not a local decoder. You know, that, that there are local decoders with, you know, rather complicated notions which are not this, which are able actually to decode rhetoric code, but the first one is definitely not a local decoder. And there were, you know, a bunch of uh, very interesting results. There is, I should mention, for instance, a very interesting decoder, which is a randomizing decoder which they do something local, but at the end, actually, they end up with decoding a toric code which is half this size. So, the, and uh, they are, of course, they perform this uh, then iteratively. There are also more Markov uh, change Monte Carlo sampler, which you can use in this setting, and you can really get close, actually, to the hashing bound. So when I say hashing bound, come back actually to what I said at the beginning. Hashing bound basically means you are in the region where actually the amount of information is exactly the logarithm of the number of typical errors in your model, okay? So it's basically, I would say, the classical capacity of a quantum channel in some real sense, okay? But you know, yeah, there are classes of channels, but you know that you can go beyond this. For instance, there is a very uh, old, uh, already old result of Shaw, which shows that, for instance, that you can go beyond, actually, for, for depolarizing chance, you can go beyond this hashing bound. Um, thing, okay, so now what I want to explain, I want to explain uh, a few things about uh, the, this uh, toric code, about surface codes, so I'm going to say a few words about a, this kind of codes wha which are able to decode and why actually this is not completely satisfactory right now for the result I've got us from. So one of the reasons why this is possible to decode the toric code, well, you know, it has many things in common in the classical setting for which actually when this graph here, when a bit is involved ex in exactly two generators, we know in the classical setting that the problem is much easier. We know basically how to decode this kind of code with uh, several decoding algorithms and basically uh, this belief propagation decoder that I mentioned here are basically all, will do almost the same thing as the maximum likelihood decoding. And it's probably definitely related the fact that we can decode surface code is probably related to this. So let me come back to this toric code, but in a slightly different way. So this is not, it, it, it's a picture which is, looks like the previous picture, but it's not. Now the qubits are not on the nodes, they are on the edges, okay? And so toric code is uh, formed in this way. You take a square here, you identify actually the left and right border and the top and bottom border. So it gives you really a distorted structure here. And uh, the qubits are now on the edges. 
and the generators are either on the faces, and the faces here, the square faces of size four, they correspond to the Z generators, so you have four Zs here, and what you have actually on the nodes, and the crosses that you have on the nodes are four, these are generators of size four of X generators. And so people, what they did at the beginning, so it was just using this KITIS idea by decoding X and Z's errors separately. And this gives you, you know, a picture where you have a qubit which is involved in two generators. A qubit is involved actually in two X generators. And <coughs> what this X generator see, they see the Z part of the error and the Z generators, they see the X part of the error. Meaning here that if I take an error in the poly group, I may express this as a product of an error which involves only identity and X and uh, an error which involves only identity and Z. The first part, the, the generators with Z, they see it, and the other one, the generators in X see it. And you may actually try first to, to find actually, for instance, the Z part of the error. So, and this turns out, if you look at what's going on if I have an error here, which is a Z error on this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, when you measure this, actually, the X generators which are not satisfied is you can pretty easily see that they are the endpoints actually of this chain. And now you might say, well, 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 if I have something like this, well, this is not so, so complicated to decode because if I have, you know, a picture like this, so I have here in blue the X generator which are not satisfied, <laughs> What I will try to do, I will try actually to find a configuration of path which link two by two actually these guys actually and the, the sum of the length of the path is minimal. And this is basically a minimum weight matching problem. So this can be done in polynomial time and so we can decode the Tori code in this non I'd say non-local way just by doing this. And you can decode the Z part. So, but if you do this, well, this Tori code which have a rate which goes to zero, and if I look at the hashing bonds for codes which are close to zero, you expect to be able for the depolarizing noise channel to be able, and I'm coming back to this noise model later on, to decode up to, let's say, a depolarizing noise of 18.9%. Mm. And if you do this decoder, actually, there's probably no hope, but you can go between 0 0.16, just because you do two, two separate decoding. And now you may also argue and say, wait, wait, you explain me something. In the quantum setting, I'm not necessarily interested in finding the most likely error. You know, and coming back to this picture here, to this, actually, this slide here, this picture, uh, really, and uh, what I'm interested in not finding the right error, but finding the right m m error module of a stabilizer group, so the right core set, just because all these errors, they have the same effect on the code. So it's not the bad, you know, the, the, the most likely error which matters, it's the most likely coset, which is not the same. And so you may say you might improve this decoder in several fashions. First of all, trying to use actually the correlation between the X and Z part, and then trying to do something like this. And the amazing thing is basically that these two things actually that there is a, a big, that ha, they have now a rather satisfying answer. So these are rather recent results. So the first result, I'm, I was very surprised when I saw this last year, Bradley Susha Vargo result. What they did <coughs> is the following thing. 
they were able actually to reduce the problem maximum, maximum likelihood decoding the Z part of the error, not finding the most likely error, but the most likely cause set. When I say the most likely cause set, the Z part of the error here, I only take the cause set which take the stabilizer which have these, okay? But assuming that you have this, you are able actually to find the most likely cause set. You are able to do the calculation exactly. So this is de definitely uh, a very, very interesting result. And they basically the reason why this can be done is this calculation turns out to be a calculation which is related to match gate circuit and for which there is a result of valiant that this kind of circuit can be simulated in polynomial time in a classical computer. It's a, it's a very, very interesting result. I really mentioned it because I think that this result will have you know, other applications. So this is the first thing. Second thing, you might say, wait, and uh, can I use actually decode them now things together? Well, you can do in an approximate way, and you can get almost actually to the hashing bound. So let's come back now really actually to the depolarizing noise model here, which is the following thing. So you have no error with priority one minus P, X, Y, or Z error with priority P over three, let's say. When you have something like this, I say that there's some correlation. Assume that, that someone tells you for at a given position that the X part of the error was an X. Assume that you have something like this. Can you say some, what can you say about the error disposition? Well, it turns out that the Z part of the error is either identity or Z with priority one half. So you have some knowledge here. On the other hand, if you have no error here, then actually it's something different. You have identity or Z with probability one minus P prime or P prime. So it's something different. And so if you are able actually to decode first the X part correctly, actually you have some knowledge that you can use actually for the Z part. Well, if you do this directly for the uh, <coughs> So the toric code, this doesn't work directly because actually the two codes, they have the same number of X and Zs. And basically, uh, the first decoder, uh, when it works, the second decoder will work for sure. And when the first decoder is stuck, you are the, you are the, it's done for the second decoder. But actually, you, what you can do actually is to pass information back and forth and you can go uh, actually almost up to the hashing bound uh, with this kind of strategy. But what I really want to mention here is an idea which did not appear in the quantum LDPC setting, which appear actually for decoding polar codes. And I really, really want to mention it because it's a very simple, a very fundamental idea. And the following one. In this case, you know, in this picture for the TOEIC code where you have as many, you know, the the number of generators with X and Z are the same, they're the same number, actually, uh, you might want to try to change things. Basically, you can attain the hashing bound with two separate decoders, one which is decoding the X part first, one which is decoding the Z part first, by trying to choose a better code for the first part, and then use actually information coming from the first decoding to the second part, which needs actually a decoder which is uh, less powerful. And if you lose some kind of asymmetric decoder with the right number of X's and Z's, actually you can attain the hashing bound in this fashion, okay? In a very rigorous way. And basically it's what they did actually for polar codes, okay? They have this, these two separate decoding algorithms and you use actually this to attain the capacity uh, the, the hashing bound in this way. And you can do this also for uh, uh, a random stabilizer code. You can attain the hashing bound in this way with the, these two separate decoders. This is easy actually to, to see. And probably what it means it's if you use this trick actually for the surface code, not for the toric code, but for a toric code, which a surface code, which are more access than Z's actually, you're probably going to get a hashing bound just in this way. 
When I say surface code, it's just a definition of this picture. You know, surface code, actually, what you just need is a surface, a tessellation of the surface, and actually the faces will actually raise to the, we will give actually the, the these generators and actually the vertices will uh, be associated to the X generator. So when you have a surface, you may have, you know, a quantum LDPC code in a natural way by doing this. And so now what I want to say is, okay, do we have surface code now which are good enough for Gottesman's theorem? Well, unfortunately not. Unfortunately not, basically because the minimum distance is, if you want to encode a linear number of qubits, is bounded by the logarithm of a length. And this is not good enough. You basically need something which is better than this, which is at least something which is polynomial in the length. This is the first thing. And this is some, something which you, you cannot do. So we have this code actually for which we can decode. What I explained actually about the toy code, okay, we can also decode actually surface code with more or less the same kind of idea. The trouble is they don't give us something that actually got us one promised. And so we need actually codes which have better minimum distance. So do we have something like this? Well, 2009, okay, there was a construction which is not a surface code at all which had distance uh, root n, so polynomial in n, which is, okay, uh, good enough for this. Number of qubits which are encoders is linear, so why not? And has actually uh, formed, the, the, this con construction uses two classical LDPC codes. And so you might say maybe the decoding algorithm for the LDPC code could be used actually to decode them, that's not true, not, not directly, just because of all the reasons that I explained before. So there's a definitely a big problem to decode this kind of codes with a classical ideas. There is an, uh, another class of code, which uh, is rather recent, so now two years ago, so this 4D hyperbolic codes, and which have also a polynomial minimum distance a, a, a number of qubits which are encoded is also linear in the length and which have a decoding algorithm. But the decoding algorithm with these Hastings, actually, it's not able actually to go up to the whole minimum distance. And that's really a drawback, actually. You, you, they, they do not give something, actually, that, uh, which we, it is needed in Gottesman theorem. We have a decoding algorithm, but it's not able to decode enough errors for this. But I really want to mention this kind of decoding algorithm for a very simple reason. Because I really think, actually, that the idea which is used, actually, for decoding this code, actually, is probably going to be used in other codes as well. So what it does, he does something ver very simple. He does local decoding. But he takes balls which are big enough. Big enough, okay, meaning something which is related to the geometry of the code. And it's related really to the construction. But let's say it's big enough. And he just decode inside each ball, he does the best what he can do to in order to reduce the syndrome in each of these balls here. And these balls actually, they don't intersect such that you don't have a problem, you know, decoding two balls actually, what's, what's going on actually in the transaction. They, they don't intersect. And you also assume actually that the ball that you are going to decode, they cover actually at, at least a constant fraction of the space of the qubit, okay? You do this. And it turns out if you analyze what's going on, you have actually a global analysis of this local decoding algorithm, which basically tells you the following, is that very high probability with the number of unsatisfied generators actually the number of unsatisfied generators that you get at the next step is multiplied by some factor which is smaller than one. So you reduce the error in this way, okay? And it's a very interesting thing because, interesting thing is you have a local decoder 
But the most interesting part is that you have a global analysis of this local decoder. And it's probably, my, my, think my um, <coughs> opinion, this is probably the way to go actually to be able actually to decode quantum LDPC codes that have a good human distance. Last thing that I should mention before I say, you know, the sign here t telling that I only have five minutes left is, uh, so I think there is a really hope actually de to decode this kind of code P and probably with, you know, a global uh, local decoder might do the job, really. I really think that they might do the job, but you need a global analysis for them, not just a local analysis that you have I in the classical setting. I should also mention that there are variations on the quantum LDPC structure which are also interesting because there are many things actually which help the decoding. So there is one idea uh, in 2006 of Todd Brown, Hans Debetak, okay, <laughs> which um, s said basically the following, if you have Ad additional <coughs> an, an additional power which is actually entanglement shared between the encoder and the decoder. And if you have something like this, and uh, noise free on one side, actually decoder side, actually the decoding problem of your quantum LDPC code becomes actually uh, just a classical decoding. And you can decode in the classical uh, fashion. So that's interesting. The problem is, do you have something like this? This share entanglement is, uh, is a lot to ask. You can actually try to get around this and to replace this shared entanglement by qubits, which are almost error-free, just by using another code to decode them, and I think like this. And this is a game which has been played recently uh, for instance, by using specially coupled LDPC codes, I'm not going to into details about this, but it's kind of code actually, for which actually you are able to decode some part, which is a very tiny part of a code, and then this information is passed slowly to other parts of the code. And with kind of this kind of code, actually, you can re get really close to the hashing bound. You um, get amazingly close to the hashing bound. But it are not LDPC in the sense that you have to protect the first and last layers. And here, actually, you lose the LDPC structure. Last thing I want to mention <coughs> is this quantum LDPC code. You may be interested in decoding them just because, for instance, of this Gottesman theorem. But you might also be interested in other questions. You know, in the classical setting, there were this problem of having LDPC codes with linear minimum distance was easily answered just by running random arguments. Take a random LDPC code of the right size and right structure, it will have linear minimum distance. Do the same thing in the quantum setting, well, 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 it's not so easy just because actually the fact that the generators have to commute, putting randomness on this is not so easy actually. And so basically right now we are stuck at root n. My guess is we have to go beyond this and it's probably a way to go beyond this. And even having quantum LDPC codes without linear, re uh, with, I mean, we do not encode, just, you encode just a constant number of qubits with linear minimum distance. This would be a great achievement, my point of view. I will finish with this. Okay, are there any questions? Looks like yeah. you see some. Well, it doesn't look too good for error correcting codes. Um, how are we doing on error detecting codes? Oh, good question. So, <coughs> error detecting codes, you know, this is uh, really a matter. Uh, so, uh, of minimum distance, so um, we, it's much simpler if you don't have to detect them just because uh, you just have, you know, to understand what's going on in the normalizer and you can say something. Uh, 
I haven't heard about uh, um, results about this, but I don't know the whole, the whole literature about this, but it's a much simpler question. Uh, I probably, well, this is a good question and it should have a good answer, but I'm, okay. <laughs> You, you, you know, the, the problem is you, you can just forget about the whole thing about uh, uh, this decoding algorithm, and you basically have to really understand uh, the sum on the, on the normalizer on, on the code. And this is probably doable and probably doable, you know, uh, the best that you can do. I, I think, you know, here, my, my guess, it's, uh, it's a question which is, uh, should be doable, but has not been done yet. N just last thing about detection. In the worst case, you still have a problem, just because, you know, this linear minimum distance, we don't know how to, to have, for instance, uh, codes. If you have LDPC codes with linear minimum distance, tell me, I will be interested in them. <laughs> okay. Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah. I think Daniel. So, uh, unless I missed it, you didn't comment on the very last point. So, I'm curious what your view is as to the prospect of beating the hashing bound with LDPC codes. <laughs> okay. Let's say the following thing. Okay, so in order to beat the hashing bound, the thing that you need. You need that the core set with respect actually to the stabilizer group, they contain many guys which are typical errors. Okay, you really need something like this. And well, the thing is if you have a LDPC code, we have probably a good chance that you have many guys actually which have the right way actually in this core set because of this. But okay. The problem is to have codes actually for which you have a also, you know, a huge number of stabilizers of low weight, and that's another problem. So I'm not so sure about the answer of this. My guess is that the strategy of Shaw and people which followed actually Shaw's strategy after this, by using this concatenation trick and trying to find a code which changes the channel in a, in a right way, might be better, but I don't know. I don't know. I, j I just mean to mention it because there are natural candidates actually for beating the hashing bound because of this fact about the, the core set. Okay. No questions. Front to Steven. Do you have anything to say about subsystem codes? Ah. <laughs> Good question also, because there are many generalization, and also I, don't, I don't talk about this variation uh, about subsystem codes. I'm not so sure, uh, you know, there's something which really helps in decoding is the entanglement assistance. Subsystem code, I'm not so sure it helps in decoding. It helps in other, for, for, for other reasons, but not for this. But might be actually looking for subsystem codes might help for other reasons. For instance, beating the hashing board with subsystem codes uh, might be something to do here. LDPC codes, I don't know. But it, it, my feeling about LDPC codes, what really helps is the entanglement assisted LDPC codes that we cannot afford right now. Okay, that, that definitely helps. Helps a lot. <laughs> okay. The other way, subsystem code, I'm not so sure that I'm going to help in the LDPC code, but I'm going to be completely wrong here. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, I, will, I will ask one. So one, one decoder that you didn't mention um, was the decoder proposed by Brevi and Ha, this sort of very simple and very heuristic decoder for topological codes. Do you see any scope for generalizing that idea to these more general LDPC codes? <sighs> Good question. <laughs> For which, actually, <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. I think it's not, I really think that the problem is not in having, this is my feeling, it's right now, it's not really in finding, you know, a very clever decoder 
my feeling is uh, trying, to, probably having a, a simple decoder for which you are able to analyze globally. That, that's my feeling is the, the right way to go. But I understand that there are many decoders, but my feeling is probably a simple decoder should be the job. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's thank Jean Pierre again. Okay?